Hello everybody and welcome to today's video. For this particular video I want to present a very special endgame from an exceptional master of the game and in particular one of the best ever masters of the endgame and that's Anatoly Karpov who had the black pieces in this game. This game is taken from uh, Milan 1975 and his opponent with the white pieces, and forgive me because I'm going to get this wrong, is Lebuzhevic. Um, let's let's refer to him as Mr. L from this point forwards, so I don't make a fool of myself. Anyway, the let's take stock of the position. The first thing you'll notice is that if we look at the king side of the board. The, piece, the positions are identical. The pawn structure and the locations of the king are absolutely equal. Next, if we look at the minor pieces, we have opposite colored bishops, which is um, notorious to, for being drawish. So we have a dark squared bishop for white and a light squared bishop for black. Again, very drawish. And now if we look at the queen side pawns, again the A and B pawns are identically uh, mirrored. However, if we look, we can see that black has this one trump in his position, the extra C pawn. So really that's the only thing separating the two sides at this point in the game. So how would you proceed? You, that's, it's black to move, so cap off to play. And I'd like you, as the game progresses, just to think about what you would do next with black. And if necessary, just pause the video every once in a while to make a decision about what you would do next, and then compare it with the actual move in the game. Um, I found this very enjoyable. I did this yesterday evening on my um, on a nice wooden set, and I enjoyed it so much that I thought I'd share it in a video. So let's get into the game. How do you think black proceeded? Well, his first move was just king to f7. So basically Karpov is just looking to centralize his king. White plays bishop to f4, just attacking the c-pawn. So what does Karpov do now? Well. He plays the most accurate move in the position, and that is c6. You may be wondering why he didn't play c5. But c5 is nowhere near as strong. And I spent some time looking at this. If, if he'd played c5, let's just analyze this briefly. If he'd played c5, Mr. L could have followed up with bishop d6 when we're forced to play b6 to defend the c-pawn and now white can attack the b-pawn with bishop c7 when we're forced to play b5 and now again white can attack black's pawn on c5 with bishop b6 so black is forced to play c4 when he's hemming in his own bishop now and black sorry white can simply play now bishop a5 and he's kind of got a watertight uh, stronghold here and it's going to be very very difficult for black to make any headway so it's interesting that just one pawn move can shift the whole position to from you know having slight winning chances to almost being a dead draw so let's go back to the the game continuation so we had c6 and then a bishop d6 so mr l is just centralizing his dark squared bishop and now karpov plays of the best move again in the position that's king e6 so already he's improved his king's position and White's king is still 
on G1. So white d decides to attack another pawn with bishop f7 and black plays again the most accurate continuation and that is g6. So why is g6 a better move than g5? Well, Karpov's plan at this stage is basically he wants to create a passed pawn on the queen side. So he wants to slow down or limit the chances for for white to make exchanges on the king side. So by playing if he played g5, it would actually make it easier for white to initiate some exchanges and increase the likelihood of getting a draw. So there's always there's very much purpose and a lot of accuracy behind every one of Karpov's moves. Uh, whereas I'm sure that Mr. L in this game was probably sure that he was going to draw the game, but one of the things that made Karpov such an excellent player was his fearless drive to win every game. So let's take a quick look at what would have happened if Mr. L had played bishop c5. So we'd have bishop c5 and the intent of this move would be to next play bishop b6 just blockading the b7 and c6 pawns and also hitting the a5 pawn and forcing it to move to a4 so through this maneuver white could have forced all of black's pawns on the queen side onto the light squares which makes it much easier to blockade the pawns and then makes it an uphill struggle to attempt to win an endgame like that. So that was one of the few inaccuracies by Karpov in this particular endgame. However, white never found this continuation and instead played the weaker move king to e3. So black now plays b6, which is the correct move. Now c5 is immune. C5 is controlled by the b-pawn. So white plays h4, making strides on the king side and hoping to initiate some exchanges of pawns, which should favor him. And now we see the move c5. So, black has succeeded in getting all of his pawns onto dark squares. There's no way for the bishop that is on f8 to attack these pawns. He would have to uh, get to one of these squares in order to do that. And because of the central location of the king, he's not able to maneuver to one of these squares. So white continues now with g4 which is again a slight inaccuracy and I wonder if you can see the best move for black in this position. You might want to just pause the video and see if you can find it. Okay, so the best move in this position, and a very accurate move, was bishop to d1. And the thing that's great about this move is that it pins the f-pawn. So if the f-pawn might like to advance to f4 to prevent the black's king from coming to the e5 square, but because of this move, he's not able to. So notice how you know white makes some very very slight inaccuracies, but by finding the best move in the position, Bach is able to start to gradually improve his position, and that's what the top level chess 
is all about. So white plays now, king e4, and now we see the move a4.